Good afternoon, financial professionals. I'm Dan Peterson, President and Managing Partner here at E4 Insurance Services, and I want to welcome you to The Brew, Building Relationships Every Week. Thanks for tuning in today. For those of you joining The Brew for the first time, welcome. We like to start The Brewcast by celebrating today's national days. Today is National Ford Mustang Day. Uh, that iconic car from the 60s and 70s, and now have been reborn, actually, uh, with Ford, Ford Motor Corp. It's also National Crawfish Day. Now, I didn't know this, but on Sunday, we did a crawfish boil at my house. Um, and so I love those Cajun mud bugs, but uh, go out and get, pick yourself up some for National Crawfish Day. And it's also National Kickball Day. I was talking with one of the staff at the office who got a concussion playing kickball, so be careful. Today's brew, we continue our April-focused planning series on estate planning. And from National Benefit Groups, Dave Sazik joins us. He's a strategic partner with our firm and assists us in a number of strategies. He was going to review compensation strategy that business owner clients face. Dave works with other financial professionals throughout the country to provide solutions to the many of the issues business clients face, such as recruiting, rewarding, retaining key employees, and correcting deficiencies in current benefit plans. He utilizes corporate-owned life insurance programs, and he reviews asset repositioning and assisting the business owner to get the most out of their business and its ultimate transfers, which ultimately, as you know, we're talking about estate planning this month, ends up on the personal balance sheet. We encourage you to use the chat box or raise your hand to ask a question. Also, all attendees are in the drawing for a CE voucher and a Starbucks gift card, and we will announce the winner at the end of today's brewcast. Thanks for tuning in. And Dave, thanks for joining us today. Sure. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate being with you again. So it's always a pleasure speaking with, uh, with the folks at E4 and your producers as well. So I figured... I know based on the time, I figure one of the things we wanted to talk about was really, you know, various ways of being able to use deferred compensation to not only help ownership retain key people, but also to be able to reward and bring in executives and key people and enrich them as well. So I figured we'll just kind of talk about a case study and then just kind of go over some different things that are happening in the non-qualified world. Um, Dave, I, I, I want to remind, uh, we... we at E4 Insurance Services, one of the co four pillars that we, we, we work on and that we really try to be the best possible firm to support financial advisors is, number one, protecting income. That's really simple, and we all know what that looks like, but pro providing liquidity, protecting investment portfolios. But the fourth is we design retention and reward strategies for employers, and you're a key part of that, and that's what you're going to share today. Absolutely. And that's really what I have in front of me. I mean, this this case study really is the epitome of the average company throughout the United States. So what we're looking at is not just unique to what we've done, but this type of company is throughout every state, throughout every region, and is something that everybody that uh, that currently works with E4 should have as far as their portfolio of clientele. So just kind of going over the highlights, and and this is this is what's what happens when ultimately a company starts getting into a generational aspect and gets to a situation where ultimately we might go from generation one to generation two with the biggest asset that the family owns a business. Um, but what happens at times is there's ultimately a generational gap, and that generational gap means that the senior generation might be exiting or retiring, but still likes the income coming from the business. And the next generation isn't yet at the point where they can ultimately take over the business. So in this case, closely held business owned by three brothers, looking to have an executive come in to become a CEO within the next three to five years. Uh, the reason is, is because three brothers have been busting their tail for the last basically 20, 30 years to build the business. They want to be able to profit from the rewards of the business and have some time to themselves and their families. So they're looking to step back, bring someone to come in. But at the same time, another family member or someone else in the company isn't yet ready to come in. So the question is, is how do you get this exciting person again? How do you get this new executive? Especially when you've got 
different situations. A family-owned business basically might have the situation from someone coming from the outside, looking at it and saying, you know, what happens when the next generation is ready to come in? What's my role? How do I kind of control that? What happens when there's not enough upfront compensation? Everybody thinks they're worth the world as far as comp, but not every company can afford everybody with a big salary up front and nothing else. At the other time periods, what do you do for the other key people? Because a company grows not just by those on the top, but by those that are in the next level of management, supervisors, and then up and comers. How do you keep those people that are engaged they're in their 30s and 50s? So again, this is the epitome of every company. How can you design something that then takes care of each one of those that you wish to be able to help and support? And that's really what we want to talk about is different ways that deferred compensation can be designed uniquely for different groups. And ultimately what we did in this case, and what we've done for many companies in very similar situations is come up with different formats of deferred compensation or phantom stock, which is a form of deferred compensation or deferred bonus, which is another form of deferred compensation. So no go back call, over that one more time. There's you, you named off three forms of deferred compensation. Correct. Uh, traditional deferred compensation itself, phantom stock, and phantom stock is really a deferred compensation plan that is tied towards the growth or performance of the company. So if the company grows, the phantom stock plan grows. If the company comes back, starts losing money, the value of the phantom stock drops with it. And then deferred bonus is basically instead of giving somebody a $5,000 cash bonus today or $10,000 cash bonus today, you defer that bonus out four, five, six, seven years. And that's what we came up over here in trying to be unique and, and basically be able to take care of that recruited CEO, the midterm individuals, and the, and the other up-and-comers as well. So what we ended up designing in this part was basically a combination plan of 50% deferred compensation, with fixed crediting, meaning that if the company turns around and gives them a $100,000 deferred comp contribution in a year, 50% of it or 50,000 is tied towards a fixed crediting interest rate. So that way we don't have any downside risk to the employee. And the other 50% was tied to phantom stock. The reason is, is because when you're bringing in that CEO whose fear is, is, hey, I want big dollars. Well, you got to put them on the spot in the line and say, if you want big dollars, then we want big performance. If we get big performance, you're going to share in that performance through fan of stock. What we did that was a little bit differently as well is people want a plan that gives them the ability to have access to some of the money before retirement. So most people think deferred compensation is retirement only, but it doesn't have to be. It's just basically pushing compensation out sometime into the future. So in this case, we created two different accounts for the executive and some of the other key people. Account A, which is tied to a five-year cliff vesting schedule, but then gives the ability for the individual to elect what's known as an in-service distribution. And then an anyone... in-service distribution. Mm -hmm. So what is an in-service distribution? I uh, most Most plans I've ever seen said you have to hit a, re a retirement milestone of 65 or 67 and then you get your start to get distribution what do you mean by in service correct so if the company permits it they can allow an individual to elect a portion of the funds the vested dollars that they receive to be paid to them sooner than retirement so in this year in this case the account a has a five-year cliff vesting schedule so after five years of of that contribution the individual is fully vested if they had elected, they could then receive full payment of that vested balance to them as well. But they also have the choice to say, well, I don't need it right now. Maybe I want to take it later on. Maybe I've got college planning in six years or seven years or 10 years. They could elect it to take it in tandem with college or some other life event or simply just say, it. I want to keep it in the plan because I really don't want those funds to pay taxes. So an in-service distribution adds flexibility to the executive on when they receive some of their funds. But Dave, I, I thought 409A, and I'm gonna play devil's advocate here a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, after, after this company called Enron and mm -hmm. executives started pulling their deferred comp, knowing that the company might be going down, I thought the government came in with some regulations, 409A, that prohibited that. You're saying there's still options that are available. 
Correct. As long as the individual pre-selected before receipt of that contribution. So if they elected in advance of receiving that contribution to say, mm -hmm. if I get a contribution, I want to take it on a certain day and make that election, then that election holds true. So they can actually get it because they've made a decision on when they want to get it. So they what know their child's going to college seven mm -hmm. years from now. They can elect on that date, that year, to receive this. Absolutely. They could pick any day within any year, as long as they've got a vested balance to be paid. Okay. So the other account is the more typical account that you see where the rest of the money gets in. The other 50,000 in our scenario goes in to retirement. And in this case, they put a more stringent cliff vesting, basically saying you have to be age 65. At that point, you become vested. But if you're still working, we're not going to force you to take your money. So the benefit was paid at the rule of later of age 65 or retirement. But most people really don't want to take their money at 65 if they're going to work to age 70. It basically just creates a tax burden that they don't want. So that's a failure in a lot of plans, basically, just to say at a specific age, because you don't want to penalize someone who still want to work hard for you. Yeah, so. I, I just was talking with a business owner yesterday, and he had a he had one of these plans that we put in place and uh, it was scheduled for age 65 or separation of service retirement. Mm -hmm. um, and he's 62, 63 now, Dave. And he said, I'm having too much fun and we just merged in another company and I want to stick around until we get that all put together and, and get everything integrated. So I probably won't retire till I'm 67. That's the perfect scenario where he has that flexibility. That's correct. And if somebody doesn't, or if a plan didn't build that in, as long as the employee communicates that they wish to work longer and the company is okay with it, they can actually elect a year in advance of when that first distribution is going to happen and delay that for an additional five years. So there is some ways to be able to correctly fix plans, and that would be one of the methodologies to do so. Just don't wait till you're 65 to make the decision that you want to wait, because I mean, otherwise you, you, you're forced to, to be able to take the money at that. Okay. The other part is, is because even though we have a combination of deferred compensation and phantom stock, that's for the CEO and the senior key people that really have an impact on the business. But there's other key people that, you know, you really want to retain a reward. And in that case, what we ended up doing is just doing the deferred compensation plan with the fixed crediting, gave them both account A, account B, so they had access to some money beforehand and the rest of it at retirement. But they didn't have to worry about the flexibility of how the company is doing because their ability to control the company is beyond their reach. So we're still rewarding them and retaining them. And then we have that last group, the up and comers, you know, the 20 year olds, 30 year olds, the 50 year olds that may not be deemed key, but they're going to be the replacement folks for the key people as they come in. And the biggest struggle that a lot of companies have right now is how do you entice individuals to stay? You know, you, you've put a lot of effort, you've trained them, they've, they've got to be strong performers, but you got to put something in place for them. And that's where the deferred bonus comes in. And what the deferred bonus does, it's very similar to what we did with that five-year cliff vesting. But in this case, what we're doing is we're going to make an award agreement. And every agreement we make basically has this money set aside for five years in this case. And then at the end of the five years, they get a lump sum payment. And the next year, we may do another one. We may do another one. Or, you know, in some businesses, some businesses are project-oriented. We could tie it to a project, completion of a project. And when that project is done and everybody's been paid and everything else, we'll give you your bonus. So there's lots of different ways to be able to structure these things. Well, that, that deferred bonus plan looks a lot like that account A in the deferred compensation plan. What's, what's the difference there? Yeah, the big difference is, is the deferred compensation because that we had that account A and that account B together. Those plans have a retirement feature inside of it. So some because there's that retirement feature for those top key employees, that's an ERISA-based plan. The deferred bonus plan is a non-ERISA plan, meaning that we don't have the full, uh, we, we have the ability to be able to offer it to more individuals. You know, in a lot of cases, deferred compensation, if it's retirement-based, is limited to only the top 5 10% of the employees in the company. Well, not everybody happens to be in the top 5 to 10% of compensation. So the deferred bonus is a plan that's eligible to all employees. 
and we can structure things very similar. Um, so it's kind of a, a short term methodology to keep people active and involved. And as soon as they start getting their, their bonuses, it's, it's like an addiction. I want my next year's. I want my next year's. And then eventually they become the key people. You offer them deferred comp and they can be part of the deferred compensation plan. So, yeah. So you're carving out, you, you can't put everybody in an ERISA type plan. You have to have the top five to 10% of the, mm -hmm. of the staff, but with this deferred bonus plan, it's a much more expanded group. That's correct. It's still a nice reward for everybody involved. It encompasses everybody. They have to be still at the company to get their payments. If they do something erroneous with the company, or if they terminate their employment, they're forfeiting whatever money is left inside of the company. So that does a couple of things. It makes them think about the strength of what the company is providing to them. And it also makes it harder for a competitor to come in because if I'm ready to get a $5,000, $50,000, $100,000 you know, benefit that's going to be paid to me, another employer is going to have to match that plus my salary, and that's painful for other employers. So it's a good way to keep your key people. The other thing is, is we take all the contributions from all these different things, and then at the end of the day, we fund it with life insurance. We need a place to put this money. You know, most medium-sized, small companies don't want to just have a promise to their employees. They want to make sure it's whole. They want to be able to point on their balance sheet and say, this funds over here, you know, these are dollars that we've kind of set aside. You know, you don't have control of it. You don't have access to it, but we just want to show you that we're thinking of you and we're putting the money aside and we're putting it into life insurance. You know, the other options, we could go into mutual funds or the company could just simply say, you know, we're not going to do anything. We're simply going to give you an IOU, but life insurance is the most secure way of being able to take care of it. So, so life insurance becomes an asset on the balance sheet of the company. Mm -hmm. The promise is is a liability, correct? That's a That's liability correct. on the ba balance sheet? That's correct. And then based what on type, that- What type of life insurance products? It's uh, many of our, our listeners, Dave, are interested in uh, placing more life insurance cases um, for, their biz for their practice. What kind of life insurance products are you seeing being used? I would say the, the product that's probably being more prevalent in, in what we're doing is, is index universal life, mainly because in some cases we might use an index strategy instead of a fixed crediting strategy is how the performance of the plan turns around. So we could use a low volatility index, we can use an S&P index, and we can use the crediting of those to be able to do the crediting for the plan. So that's come along quite a ways, especially in the line since both corporations and employees in, are a little, a little more risk adverse, you know, on that line, especially in the middle markets or the smaller businesses. They don't want to go backwards when they've set aside funds. And the employees are looking at this. I've got this great benefit. I don't want a market correction to wipe it out. So indexes is, is one methodology, but for those that are willing to take risk, those that want the ups and downs of the market, we can use a variable universal contract and, and give them that as well. Or whole life as well as universal life, you know, if we're going with a traditional fixed crediting plan. So sure. no limitations. So, but these okay. are things that we've been doing quite a bit. Like I said, this type of company, this view, they're everywhere. They, they really are. It's just finding out what needs and what types of things are happening within the businesses. And since we kind of went through, you know, the last few years after COVID where companies hired tons of people and then unfortunately are letting people go, there's still a core group of individuals. They want to make sure it don't go anywhere. And the best way to do it is through one of these plans. So. And Dave, and, you work with all, all kinds of businesses from uh, construction firms, law firms, mm -hmm. non-for-profits. Uh, I think you up and down the uh, the spectrum of taxation and and, and design. It's it's your firm has a lot of experience with all all types of employers. Correct. Correct. Uh, the plans are appropriate for all structures, C corps, pass throughs, nonprofits. They each have their own little uniquenesses in which you have to be careful of. Um, you know. Uh, owners, you know, owners are typically taking a look at it and saying, geez, can I participate? And the answer is, is yes, if they're a C-Corp. The answer is no, if they're an S-Corp or an LLC or a pass-through. But as far as key employees, a key employee in any type of entity can be a participant in one of these plans. Um, 
what I have here is just some comparisons of how the different plans work. Um, you know, like we talked about beforehand, if somebody wants to do a plan for any and all employees, the deferred bonus is a great mechanism. If they want to limit it to the highly compensated, deferred compensation phantom stock is the way to be able to go. Um, but we've got clients that have key employees, both in a deferred bonus and deferred comp and phantom stock. So a little bit of all. So nothing, nothing major in that. It's just understand your client and figure out what they want to do. And, and one of the nice things, Dave, is that you're there to partner with us and our advisors at the design. We talk about designing strategies for employers to reward and retain. You're really there to help design. But the other thing that, that we like strategically of working with your firm and National Benefit Group is that you're also there to help uh, administer the plans on an ongoing basis. So uh, can you t just touch on that? Because sometimes advisors say, well, I I'm not going to be here when, when Gen 2 is actually executing upon this. I, yeah, I know Gen 1, but how do I know this is going to be taken care of and that, 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 you know, that it's going to be administered properly? Correct. And that was basically always been the functionality of what our firm is. You know, National Benefits Group provides the assistance to design the plan. But if you design a plan, you've got to be able to record keep and administer the plan as well. Uh, because that's the biggest burden on the corporation, could be the biggest burden on you as the producer is, you know, we put in a great plan, we put in a great life insurance program, but how do we make it work? How do we make it shine? And by us being able to help with the administration, the record keeping, we've got a continuum. So that way, whether we're working with the first generation, the second generation, our goal is to allow the company, the client, do what they do best. And they themselves aren't in the business of being in deferred compensation. So let them build what they build. Let us do what we do. The beauty is, is that you as the producer, it's still your client. It's always going to be your client. It just helps you expand that relationship that you have with your client with one more spoke, one more thing to basically continually talk with them about. Well, that's excellent, Dave. I, I just want to thank you for being here today. Um, we, we really appreciate partnering with you and your contact is here. We'll be sending this out, uh, your slide and uh, your contact information with our communication. So any of the listeners or our advisors will also get this, but uh, we really want to appreciate, share our appreciation with you, Dave, for being on today's brew. And uh, we do have a giveaway. So if I could ask you to pick a number between one and 27, Number would be 22. Who's our winner? Megan is our winner today. Megan, you'll be getting a Starbucks gift card uh, and also a uh, CE credit. Uh, so a, a CE voucher to, to uh, get some free CE. So we thank you for being on the brew today. Well, that's our, that's our, uh, our, our brew for this week. I want to remind everybody that next week's brew, we will welcome attorney Eric Christofferson to share his experiences. Eric's mission is to help families of all backgrounds in educating, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, preserve and protect their financial legacy. He works with estates of all sizes and takes really great pride in educating middle-class families on estate planning and helping them implement techniques previously only available to the 1%. Eric will discuss the importance of having a game plan for your client's estate planning in a game where the rules always change. So we look forward to next week's brew. Appreciate you being on today. David, thanks again. And uh, we'll be reaching out and, and uh, introducing you to more contacts going forward. So looking forward. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone.